Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, almighty, eternal, and merciful, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Father, I pray this morning that you would open our minds, illuminate our minds by the power of your spirit that we may understand your word and that our lives may be conformed to what we have rightly understood, that in nothing we may be displeasing unto your majesty. Father, we pray this to you, our Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Well, the year is 1858. The United States is becoming less and less united every day. Issues of slavery, of tariffs, of states' rights are dividing the nation like never before. There are talks of secession. Certain states are threatening to leave the Union, to shatter the unity of the United States. And in the midst of this tumultuous time, a young man from Illinois accepts the Republican nomination to the Senate. His name was Abraham Lincoln. And in his acceptance speech, he spoke these famous words. He said this, A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. These words were eerily prophetic, we see now. It was only two years after this that the first shot the first shot in the Civil War between the states was fired. Eventually, after much bloodshed and many lost lives, the nation was reunited under the banner of freedom. But Lincoln's principle, which he took from Scripture, still rings true. A nation divided against itself cannot stand. Unity must be protected and procured at all costs. And the church is no different. Any organization is no different. Any organization, any group, any family, any marriage, any church will not endure in times of hardship if it is divided. A church divided against itself will not stand. It can't be effective. It will either succumb under the, the pressure of opposition externally or it will succumb to a lack of purpose, a lack of advancing the gospel embroiled in internal disputes. And frankly, a church divided against itself is a disgrace to the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what does this have to do with Philippians? Well, the main theme of Philippians is unity. And our text this morning is all about unity. It's the unity of the Philippian church and by extension, the unity of our church. Everything we're going to see this morning in this text is about unity. Now, we'll be looking at 2, 1 through 5 this morning, but let's remember the context. Let's remember what came before. We, we heard in, in chapter 1, verses 27 through 30, that our, we must live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we must discharge our duties as heavenly citizens worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in that text, Paul also encouraged us to strive side by side, to be of one mind, and he's going to pick up that charge once again. Because we need to be united to endure external pressure and internal opposition as well, understanding that it's a gift of God. But now in two, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, Paul turns and addresses the issues inside the church. Paul addresses how to protect the church from division, from internal issues, from internal opposition. 
Think about it. If the church is going to endure external opposition, that, that's a given, that is going to happen, it must be internally unified. If we're, gonna, if we're gonna resist the pressures of the outside world, we must be united as one body. Paul touches on this in chapter 1, 27 through 30, but now in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4, he gives, a, he gives a, some more detail on exactly how to accomplish this, exactly what Christ-like unity looks like for his church. And this morning, we're gonna see three things. We're gonna see the basis for unity, the charge to unity, and the way of unity. That's where we're headed this morning. So let's, let's start off by reading the text. And I want to start in, in chapter 1, verse 27, just, just so we get the full context. So grab your Bible. Turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. And let's, let's, let's hear from God's word this morning, from God's inspired and inerrant word this morning. The Apostle Paul writes this. Again, starting in chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for, your, that for the sake of Christ... You should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, as we zoom in on verse, verses one through four of chapter two, what we're going to see, the first thing we're going to see is the basis of unity. And the basis of unity is God's blessing in our lives. The basis of unity is God's blessing in our lives. In other words, the foundation for unity is God's grace at work in our lives. We can be uni united, we can be unified because we are united in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we must look to God's grace at work in our lives and then look to each other in unity. When, when exhorting the Philippian church to unity, Paul begins here with their shared experience of God's grace. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, he says, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and any sympathy. Do you see what he's doing? But before he gives the command that comes in verse two, he speaks of God's grace, of God's work in the Philippian church. Now, he mentions four things, and all four of these things mentioned in verse 1 are things that have come from God to the Philippian church. So let's look at those. Let's break it down. The first thing he mentions is encouragement in Christ. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, encouragement, comfort, consolation in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we have this encouragement by the very fact that we are in Christ, that we believe in Christ Jesus, that we have salvation. We, we have a relationship with Christ. S simply by faith in Christ, you have received all of the countless blessings that come to you. Justification, forgiveness, redemption, sanctification, adoption, glorification, regeneration, and much more. These are the comfort. This is the comfort, the encouragement that we have in Christ. He also says if there's any comfort from love, comfort from God's love. Again, the Philippian church was enduring persecution. And they were comforted by the love of God. Christian, you can take comfort in the fact that God loves you unconditionally. His love has come to you even while you were dead in your sins. Not only that, but he loved you when you rejected him. 
And this is the comfort that we have from love. Because God is love, we can take comfort. Because the God of all comfort has placed his love on us. He also says if there's, if there's any participation in the Spirit, this is the same word for fellowship. Fellowship in the gift of the Holy Spirit. As a gathered church, the Bible teaches us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is building us up. We are the gathering of people indwelt by the very Spirit of God. We have fellowship with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work within us producing the fruits of the Spirit. Is there any affection and sympathy? Affection and sympathy from God to us. Compassion, compassion from God to us. Sympathy from God to us. Again, in Christ, we have a tangible expression of God's love, of God's compassion, of God's sympathy for us. All four of these things, encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, participation in the Spirit, and affection and sympathy are gifts of God's grace to believers in Christ. We have done nothing to earn these. All of these are benefits of the salvation that we have. All of these we have because God loved us and bestows his grace upon us through faith. So Paul starts there, and he starts there for a reason, because he's laying the groundwork for unity. If you read Paul's letters, he always starts with the grace of God, lays the groundwork, and then issues his commands from there. Because again, we have to understand God's grace before we can even seek to ever fulfill any of his commands. So he lays the groundwork for his call to unity and the grace of God, our, our shared experience of God's grace. And the way he structures it is kind of strange. It almost sounds like he's asking, is, is there any encouragement of Christ? Is there any participation of the Spirit? But, but don't be fooled by that word, if. Th these four things are things that Paul knows that the, the Philippians have experienced because they're believers in Christ. In other words, he, Paul's kind of using a form of a question that it, it has an obvious answer, yes. Right? We do this. We have questions like this. Is the Pope Catholic? Well, duh. That, that's, that's the kind of question he's using, right? Does Rob like brownies with walnuts? Duh. Right? These are questions with very obvious answers, okay? That's the way he's employing this term. So, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, in other words, if you know anything of God's grace, he's laying the foundation for his command in verse 2. It's the wonderful grace of God. Why does he begin there again? Because the more that you meditate on God's grace in your life, the more that grace will flow out from you to other people. The more that you understand the radical nature of God's love and God's grace to you, the more humble you become. That is why Paul begins here with his call to unity, with a reminder of the amazing grace of God. He's saying, of course you have these. Of course there's encouragement of Christ. Of course you have participation in the Spirit. So then, out of that, here's what I want you to do. So we see that the basis of this unity is God's gracious blessing in our lives. And now that the Apostle Paul has reminded us of God's amazing grace, we are ready to hear his exhortation to unity, which is in verse 2. And we see this, that the charge to unity is the right mindset. The charge to unity is the right mindset. Paul here commands us to be united in our thinking. Paul calls us to unite around one singular idea, one singular purpose, one singular mission. He commands them to have one love. Look at verse 2. He says this, Complete my joy. How are they going to complete his joy? By being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So, so that's finally, and, and again, well, not again, because I didn't say this yet, but verses one through four is one sentence in Greek. So it's, it's really one contained idea. Be of the same mind. That's the overarching command Everything else flows through that. What does it mean to be the same mind? Have the same love. 
Be of full accord in a one mind, one purpose. We see in this text that, that Paul cares so much for the Philippians that his joy will be complete if they are unified. That's how important the unity of this church is. And by extension, how important the unity of our church is. This not only highlights the fact that Paul loves them, but again, it, it shows the emphasis that he places on unity. The famous reformer John Calvin describes this verse in, in, the, in just these perfect words. Listen to what he says. He says, Here again we may see how little anxiety he had as to himself, Paul, provided only it went well with the church of Christ. He was kept shut up in prison and bound with chains. He was reckoned worthy of capital punishment. Before his view were tortures. Near at hand was the executioner. Yet, all these things do not prevent his experiencing unmingled joy, provided he sees that the churches are in good condition. Now what he reckons the chief indication of a prosperous condition of the church is when mutual agreement prevails in it, in brotherly harmony. In other words, Paul's key statistic, his key indicator for the health of a church is unity. It's found in this verse. It's, it's being of the same mind, having the same love, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Calvin's right. Paul charges the Philippians to be of one mind. And we'll see this language as we continue through Philippians. We'll see this language keep popping up. We already saw it in verses uh, 27 through 30 of chapter 1. Because Paul is going to continuously hammer this point. Because the church will not survive if it is divided. Again, a church divided cannot stand. Paul will, simply, will be joyful simply if he knows that the Philippians are unified and of the same mind. Again, because if they are unified, if they have the same mind, if they are thinking the one thing, if they have the same love, then they will advance the gospel and they will bear persecution in a way that glorifies God. If they are divided, if everyone in the church has, is pursuing their own ideas and their own missions and trying to advance their own self-interests, then the church will fail. It will succumb under the external pressure of persecution. It will, it will drift off mission and won't, won't advance the gospel. Paul knows this. So he charges the Philippians to be unified, one mind, one accord, one purpose. But, but what, what does this mean? What, what exactly is Paul calling for? How does this speak to our church? Well, to be of the same mind... To, to have the same love, to be of one accord, means, it means that, that as a church, as a gathering of believers, we, we have a single-minded focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we must be in one mind. We are, we are a collective body in harmony, seeking to know Christ and make him known. We must all be pointed in that direction, pointed in the same direction. We must all understand and be unified under the banner of Christ in the advance of his gospel. This is what the purpose of a church is, and this is what it means to live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That must be our focus as individuals and as a church. And if that's our focus, then we will be of one mind, of one love hearing the words of the gospel and advancing the cause of the gospel, knowing Christ and making him known. That must be our focus. We must be unified around the one thing. This is the mindset that we must have, knowing Christ and making him known. Now, don't get me wrong. This doesn't, having one mind is, is not some like weird thing where we're all robots and everyone dresses the same and everyone has the same hobbies and stuff like that. That's not what Paul's getting at. It, it doesn't mean we can't disagree on anything, right? It, we are going to disagree on things. It, it's natural. We're all individuals. God has created us individually. For example, in Landon's adult core class that he's teaching, we've been examining different understandings of the end times. And one of the main things that Landon has taught us that we all know, even though we pretend like we don't, is that faithful Christians can disagree on this. And it's okay. Now, why can we disagree and still be unified? Because we all agree on the main things. Jesus Christ is Lord. Salvation is found in his name and he is returning to judge the living and the dead. 
We may have some disagreements on some of the the details of that, but we are united around the one thing. That is how unity works. Because we have the same love, Jesus Christ and his gospel. We, We must have our minds set on this unity, set on Christ, and set on the advance of the gospel. And and while unity is is the theme of Philippians, and again, we'll see it continuously, this is not the only place. This is not the, the Philippian church is not the only church that Paul calls to unity. It permeates almost all of his letters in some form or fashion. And again, this just highlights how important it is. Paul says this to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 1.10. He says this, I appeal to you, brothers, By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, it's the same word there, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. You can see the similar language. To the Roman church, Paul says this in Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty or proud, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. We can begin to see in that text some of the things that, that cause division, pride. And then Paul says this to the Ephesian church. And this one has a very striking similarity with Paul's words here in Philippians. Listen to what he says. You'll notice some of the same key words. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager, listen listen to that, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Paul continues, there is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. So so you see the theme. This is what we are called to as the body of Christ, to be one. Why? Paul says in Ephesians, there's one body and one, there are no other spirits. So if there's one spirit, we must be one. We are to be of the same mind, having the same love. We are to live to know Christ and make him known and be united. That is the charge to unity the right mindset. So we've seen this, that the the basis of unity is God's gracious blessing in our life. We've, We've seen that the charge to unity is the right mindset. And now thirdly, we see the way of unity. And that's a proper view of self and others. The way of unity, a proper view of self and others. In other words, the way of unity is humility. The way of unity is humility. The way of unity is is a radical selflessness. The way of unity is a community of believers caring for one another. You saw that in all of those texts I just read. That is what a church who is fulfilling God's charge to unity looks like. It is accomplished through this radical humility. Look at what Paul says in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That is the way of unity. That is what it looks like tangibly. It's a proper view of ourself and of others. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. That means we're not asking the question, what's in it for me? Well, what do I get out of this? If I don't get anything, I'm not going to really do it. it. It means that we don't serve for recognition. It means that we don't view ourselves more highly than we should. The, the King James translates this word conceit as vain glory, which, which, is, a, which is a great translation because it, it means that we're not puffed up with, with pride, a false view of how great we really are. It's empty. It means that we don't have an exaggerated view of how important we truly are. In other words, Paul says, don't don't think you're somebody special because you're not. You're no better than anyone else. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So, So that's what we're not supposed to do. 
But what are we supposed to do? Well, look at the second half of that verse. But, so here's the contrast. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Out of the humbleness of your heart, Paul says, consider other people as more important than you. That is the key. That that is the way of unity. That is humility that will allow this to flourish. But where does this come from? Where does this humility come from? Well, we're right back in verse 1 where Paul started. Our humility comes from the gospel. One author puts it this way. He says, humility comes from honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. Humility comes from honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. That's exactly it. The, The humble Christian understands how sinful they truly are. The humble Christian understands that God is holy. The humble Christian understands that the only reason that they are saved is purely by the grace of God in spite of all of their sin. And so the humble Christian can't think of themselves as better than anyone else. Because like Paul says, they understand they are the chief of sinners. They didn't deserve any of God's grace, and yet God gave it to them. The humble person understands that all they have and all that they are is a gift of God's grace. And out of this, they are correctly able to see how small and insignificant they truly are. That is humility. And that that humility will enable you to count others as more significant than yourself. This is illustrated well by this, this short story. One author writes this. After worrying for a half an hour that we wouldn't get on an overbooked flight, my wife and I were summoned to the check-in desk. A smiling agent whispered that this was our lucky day. He was bumping us to first class. That never happens to me, by the way. I'm still waiting. This this was the first and only time, he says, we we have been pampered on an airplane with good food, hot coffee, and plenty of elbow room. We played a little game trying to guess who else didn't belong in first class. One man padded around the cabin in his socks, restlessly sampling magazines, playing with but never actually using the in-flight phones. Okay, so obviously this is a bit dated. Twice he sneezed so loudly we thought the oxygen mask would drop down. And when the attendant brought linen tablecloths for our breakfast trays, he tucked his into his collar as a bib. Obviously he didn't fit in. The author continues, We see misfits at church too. People who obviously don't belong. People who embarrass us and cause the rest of us to feel superior. But the truth is that we don't belong there any more than they do. And that's the realization. Because you realize that the only reason you're here is by the grace of God. It's the only reason any of us are here. And when you realize that, it frees you to to act in humility, to count others as more significant than yourself. All of us are here only by the grace of God. Without Christ, we are all equally condemned. And so we must count others as more significant of ourselves than ourselves if we truly understand the grace of God. Now, is this hard? Of course it's hard. John, Calvin, again, commenting on this passage, says, If anything in our whole life is difficult, this above everything else is. So, of course, it's hard. But, but this is the calling of the Christian life. This is the calling for our church. This is simply part of the package of becoming a Christ follower. But but let's not gloss over how unique this calling is. Think for a moment the radical nature of this. Now, Now, we don't feel it as much in our culture because we don't really live in a society that is stratified or like has a caste system. But again, think of what we learned last week about the Philippian church. They were a Roman church, a Roman society. Some in the congregation hearing this letter were Roman citizens. Maybe they were politicians. Some were rich. Some were poor. Some were distinguished Roman war veterans. Some were slaves. And yet, Paul tells this church, this this stratified society, you don't count anyone as higher than you. In fact, Count everyone else as more important than you. Even you, Mr. Roman war veteran with all your medals, that slave sitting right there, count him as more important than you. This is radical. 
This is, this is radical. In fact, in their culture, it would have been offensive. What are you talking about? Right? It's offensive. It's, it's radical in nature. Again, humility was not a virtue in their society. But that is what the call is. In humility, you, I, all of us are to consider each one as more important than ourselves. That is the way of unity. But Paul doesn't stop there. You see, the way of unity involves more than just thinking of others more highly. It involves action. He, says, he finishes in verse 4. Let each one of you, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Well, what does this mean? In other words, we are called to be paying close attention and actively looking for ways to serve and care for each other. We are to exert effort in finding ways to care for each other's needs. This is more than just kind of the, okay, well, let me know if I can do anything. Let me know if I can do anything, right? And there's nothing wrong with saying that, but sometimes we kind of use that as a cop-out if we're honest. There's a place for that. There's a place for the I'm praying for you, but Paul is calling us to something higher, to actual action, to expend energy in finding ways to care for one another. It's intentional time intentional thinking. How can I serve this person? How can I serve this person? How can I serve their interests? That's the way of unity. It's a proper view of self and of others, thinking of others more highly than ourselves, looking to others' interests more than our own. So we've seen the basis of unity. It's God's grace in our lives. The charge to unity, it's the right mindset The way of unity. It's a proper view of ourselves and others. This is what Paul calls the Philippians to, and it's what he's calling us to this morning. I'd like to end our time together by simply thinking of what this might look like practically in our context. But we we have to keep this in mind. Again, we tend to skip over the grace. We need to remember that the way that we get here, the way that we get this humility is not by just thinking, I need to be humble, I need to be humble, I need to be humble by understanding what scripture teaches about us and what scripture teaches about the grace of God. It's by meditating on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how we'll attain this unity. The love of God must flow through us. It should overflow to each other. So what might this look like? Well, let's think of the church context. Unity looks like church members putting the needs of other members above their own. It looks like willingly serving in roles that maybe is not your favorite thing to do without grumbling. It looks like being generous with your time. It looks like willingly serving, again, even if you don't receive any recognition and not being bitter about it. It looks like being willing to rebuke someone who's causing division in the body. It looks like being willing to help others in the church, even if you think, well, they should just help themselves, don't they know this by now? No. It's it's by willingly spending time in prayer for your leaders and for the rest of your brothers and sisters here. It's by not hoarding your money, but willingly giving to the church, both in the offering and just as we live day-to-day life with each other in order to advance the cause of the gospel. And for those of us who have joined us in membership, this is, this is what we agreed to when we signed our church covenant. Again, it's, it's nothing unscriptural. The words of our church covenant just come from scripture. You'll see that. And I would, get, I would take a side note here. If you haven't joined us in membership, I would encourage you. It's a great way to just simply say, I want to do this, what Paul is calling us here in Philippians 2. Membership is a beautiful thing because, again, we simply affirm the words of Scripture. I want to just read you the words of our membership covenant. I think I have a slide here. It may be at the end. Um, Here's what our membership covenant says. And again, listen to the words. These are straight from Scripture. It says that we covenant together that we will be kind to each other and forgiving even as God has forgiven us. We will carefully seek to put away all bitterness and evil speaking, but instead look for every opportunity to serve others for Christ's sake. Sound familiar? We will pray for those who have the rule over us and will submit to the oversight and discipline of the officers and members of our church. Also, we will give as God has prospered us, as God loves a cheerful giver. And finally, we confidently pray together 
with thanksgiving that God will continue to work through us for the effective working of his word both here and throughout the world. That's, that's our membership covenant. If you're a member here, you have, you have signed saying this is what you will seek to do. It's nothing more than the words that we find in Philippians chapter 2. And so I ask you, are you seeking to fulfill this? Are you putting your needs above the needs of the people of this church maybe? Again, think of some different categories. Your money, your time, your energy. Are you hoarding these things? Or are you following what Apostle Paul says and and giving them away for the sake of others? Now, there's some sense in which we all fail at this. But the solution is the same. We, We look to Christ. We look to his grace. We repent and we move forward. See, we we can repent and improve because we know the grace of God. That is what we do. So that's what it might look like in a larger church context. But, But these verses apply to our smaller communities as well. Think about our marriage. Think about our marriages. Husbands, this charge to unity applies to your marriage as well to the church. You are called to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus humiliated himself, as we saw last week, for his bride. Jesus considered the needs of his bride as more important than his own. Husbands, I would ask you, do you use your God-given role as leader of the family for your own advantage or for the advantage of your family? For your own gain? Or do you view your role as something to be leveraged for the good of your wife and children? Do, Do you seek to fulfill your wife's needs before your own? Do you get angry when she doesn't fulfill your needs? Or do you steamroll her with your authority? See, that's that's not what we are called to. That is not Christ-like behavior. It's the opposite, in fact. God is calling us to use our God-given role and authority for the advantage of our family. That's what it means to love our wives like Christ loved the church, to pour ourselves out for their needs. Not just the needs that we think, they have or she has, but the needs that she says she has. The Bible calls us not only to love our wives, but to be understanding of them. And so in light of this text, men, we must love our wives well if we want to be Christ-like. Now, of course, we've failed many times at this. I have. But again, the solution, with our eyes on God's grace, with our eyes on Christ, we can repent and continue to strive to be like Christ. We, we look to Christ. We remember his grace. We turn and we, we follow him in obedience. But wives, the same thing applies to you. You are called in scripture to support your husbands. You are called to put his needs before yours. This is the way to think about marriage. Do, do you use your God-given role as wife to your own advantage for your own fulfillment? Or are you, are you seeking to use it to serve the needs of your husband? Do you respect him? Are you selfish towards your husband or selfless? Again, one way to see this is do you get angry when your husband fails? You also are called to pour yourself out for the needs of your family. And like like us men, I'm sure you've failed many times. But with your eyes on Jesus and focusing on his grace, continue to strive to be like Christ. Remember his grace, repent and move forward in obedience. This call applies to parents as well. Parents, we are called to give ourselves to our children and to put their needs above ours. We are called to give of our energy and our time to train them in the scriptures. Are you doing that? Or are you selfishly hoarding your time and and trying to give that responsibility to the kids' church teachers? There's a temptation there. Don't forsake your responsibility. That is one of the ways that you care for them. Do you look at the needs of your children as as an annoyance, as an interruption of what you want to do? Or do you put their needs before your own? Parents, again, we've failed many times at this. But we're not to focus on our failure. We're to look to Christ, to his grace, repent from that, and again, move forward in obedience. Now, there's a concern here for everyone, right? The obvious question is, look, if I put everyone else's needs above mine, who's going to look out for me? 
Who's going to take care of my needs? Now, the, the beauty of biblical unity in, in a family, in a marriage, in a church, is that when it's working right, everyone's needs are getting met because everyone is caring for everyone. You don't have to look out for your needs because everyone else is serving you as you serve them. But the hard part is, we are not called to unity only when it's perfect. We are not called to selflessness only if others serve you as much as you serve them. That's just a, the flip side of selfishness. No, Christ calls us to selflessness, even though it may not get reciprocated, even though others may fail to serve you. That's the hard part. You, you are called to selflessness even if your spouse is a selfish jerk, even though your kids will maybe not acknowledge anything you do for them. Even though you may give of your money more than others and you may say, hey, that person has more money. Why don't they give more? I'm not giving anymore. No, that's not a Christ-like attitude. That's not what Paul's calling us to. We, we are called to give of ourselves even though we may get no recognition, no re reciprocity, nothing. It doesn't matter. We're called to fulfill this command if we understand the grace of God. Why? Because Christ had this mindset. Look at verse 5. Paul says this, have this mind, this mind, this mindset that he's been talking about, have this mindset among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Or you could say, which was in Christ Jesus. In other words, this is the key here, Paul, and this is what unifies the message of last week with this week. The mindset that Paul is calling us to, everything we've just heard is the mind of Christ. It's, it's the mind that enabled Christ to humiliate himself for us. And so Paul simply says to the Philippians, you call yourself Christ followers? This is what it looks like. Self-sacrifice, selflessness. Why? Because that's what Christ did. That's how Christ thought. Everything we heard last week about hum the humiliation of Christ was not simply a, a nice doctrinal lesson, but it was a calling for us to act and think the same way that Christ did. God is calling us in this text to pursue unity through humility. We, we've seen the basis of unity, the charge to unity, and the way of unity. And ultimately, we see the example of unity in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the one that we claim to follow. And so we don't just get to pick and choose which ways we follow him. He humbled himself. We also must humble ourselves. Now it's a, it's a hard calling. Like Calvin says, it's, it's, the, it's maybe the hardest thing we ever have to do, but by the grace of God, we will strive together to fulfill it, even though we fail. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an option. As a church of people who claim the name of Christ, again, we must be unified in this. So my exhortation to you this morning is, is let us humble ourselves in the sight of God, in the sight of each other, and put our needs above our own. Let us lean as, on God's grace as our foundation. Let us be of one mind uh, to follow the way of unity and humility as we constantly seek to serve each other. A marriage divided will not stand. A family divided will not stand, and certainly a church divided will not stand. So let us together pursue unity through humility. Christ is our Lord, our Savior, and our example. This is the mindset that we must seek after. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you've given us a hard calling. It's a glorious calling but it's hard. Father, we, we are so selfish. But Father, you've, while you've given us a hard calling, you've given us and shown us your glorious grace. <clears throat> Father, my prayer this morning is that everyone here would understand the grace, your grace in such a deep way that it would just overflow to everyone around them to their spouses, to their friends, to their family, to their children, to those here in this church, to their coworkers, to everyone. 
Father, help us to depend on your grace and to strive together for unity. And Father, help us to be gracious when we fail. That's just part of the package as well. We're all stumbling through this thing. So Father, as we participate in your Holy Spirit, as we saw in verse one, work the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Unify us together under the banner of Christ. Father, my prayer this morning is that we would know Christ and seek to make him known. Make this happen amongst us, God, without your working, it won't happen. So we humbly ask you this morning. We humbly depend upon you this morning. Work amongst us. Humble us, Father, that we may have the mindset of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.